Hi, I'm Gordon Palmer. Welcome to our service here for Clement Church for Sunday, May the 2nd, um, a communion service. So um, please have, if you want to take part in the communion, your bread and wine or alternatives um, with you. As well as uh, myself, Leslie Ogilvie, will be taking part in the service of the Bible reading, um, Lorna Kirk in our prayers for others, and Karen Palmer will be with me for communion. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church in Rome, wrote these words, We glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Therefore, the strength of God, the help of God coming to us in our need, strength will rise, is our opening hymn. Strength will rise. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that we do have peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we approach you, we do not have to worry about what kind of mood you're going to be in. We don't have to be anxious about whether or not you want us or want to receive us, but we can come with confidence because Christ has died, Christ has risen for us. And in that death and in that rising, our Lord Jesus has done away with all that separates us from you. He has brought us together. He has reconciled you and this fallen and broken humanity. So might as we approach you, might as we worship you today, know and the fruits and the blessings of reconciliation, of peace being made with God. And we thank you for your promises that you keep about being with us and, and among us, and that you are for us. And even in times when things are um, hard, even in times when things seem difficult, you do not go away, you do not turn your back, 
But you are shaping and molding us, bringing about perseverance, character, and, and hope. And we thank you that just as the Apostle says, hope does not disappoint. And we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit poured out upon us and given, given to us that we might not just simply believe in you, but know you and experience you and taste you. And so, Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you for your salvation. And great as that salvation is, and high the price that you have paid for it, we acknowledge that at times we've taken it lightly, and at times we've treated it as though it were no big deal. Forgive us when our hearts have not been moved in gratitude to you. Forgive us when praise has not been on our lips. Forgive us when we've seen only the hard times and not seen the blessings that there, is in, that there are in Christ. Forgive us when we've taken your salvation, as it were, and, and hidden it away rather than sought to live it out in the world today. And Lord, as you forgive us, once more might your Holy Spirit be poured into our hearts, assuring us of peace and pardon with you assuring us of the new life and the fullness of life that there is in Christ, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This morning's reading is from James chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 1 to 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings trials and temptations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above 
coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits for all he created. Amen. I can be sure that this uh, is a true story because uh, people make things up, but it makes a point well. But it's a story of one time there was a, a Christian convention, a Christian conference going on, and the preacher um, was standing in front of the, um, the congregation who were there for the evening. There was hundreds of them. It was a big event. It was a big conference, big convention. And as he stood there on this platform in, in front of hundreds and hundreds of people who were waiting for the message, who had turned up eagerly, the Bible was ready to hear God's word, he, he said to them, hands up. Who wants to go to heaven? Well, in front of him, of course, there was a sea of hands, a big forest of hands all over the place. And so he asked another question. He said, hands up, who wants to go to heaven tonight? <sighs> and suddenly, kind of a wee bit of embarrassment in the room. Did I, did I leave my hand up? Did I put my hand down? Some embarrassed sniggers and, and giggles. Suddenly the rooms got filled with uncertainty and awkwardness. Oh, it might have been similar if, uh, if we'd said, or if I'd said at the beginning of this series, if um, people of Claremont, hand, hands up, who wants to grow in the Christian life? Who, who wants to grow in following Jesus and knowing Jesus, knowing God better? Well, I can't see your hands out there, but I, I hope that they're up or at least instinctively up. Yes, that's what I want. But then suppose we move on to the question, who, who wants to grow in following Jesus? Who wants to know God better through suffering? Uh, well, maybe that's a bit like being asked about going to heaven tonight. I'm not so sure about that. There's some debate about who wrote this uh, New Testament book of James, but no matter who it was, he was very realistic and very straight to the point. He's writing verse 1 of chapter 1 to uh, Christians who are scattered, the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. He's writing to Christians who are a small group of people and people who were hurting, people who were being persecuted, who, people who were suffering. So what should or what do Christians do when life is a series of heavy trials. How, how should we act when it seems that our faith in following Jesus is giving us more trouble than it seems to be blessing us? Seems to be giving us more problems than solutions. Jesus himself spent much of his ministry under pressure, and he warned his followers to expect the stresses, the strains, the, op the opposition that he himself had. John chapter 15, at verse 18 to 21, he underlines that just before he's going to the cross too. The world's hated me, it's going to hate you too. And James knew that this little gatherings of believers across the place that he was writing to were going to have trials of many different kinds, he says in verse 2. Some pressures on Jesus' followers are ones that we might expect. Temptations to cheat, trying to overcome them. Learning about forgiveness, about turning the other cheek. Other trials come and take us completely by surprise. But what does James then say to this small scattered church finding its feet in a hostile world, this group of people trying to make sense of this business of following Jesus? Well, three things in the um, first um, 11, or 12, 11 verses of the chapter. Firstly, he says, verses 2 to 4, consider it pure joy. pure joy. James, are you pure joking? Consider it pure joy when you suffer. Isn't it great fun to have rocks thrown at you? Isn't it fabulous to get a doing? What could be more fun than being thrown to the lions? It's wonderful. Consider it pure joy. 
Well, clearly that's not what he means. James and Jesus before him is not saying that persecution should make us happy. We're not being told to pretend that we enjoy pain, that we enjoy being humiliated and tortured. Rather, the, the, the verse says, verse 2, consider. Consider it pure joy. Let us think about it and, and work out. This is how we should understand and view trials. Not by pretending it's fun. Not by just saying, where can I get a stiff upper lip? Rather, he's saying, consider, think about our trials in, in a certain way. Trials and opposition can actually help us. They teach us to persevere, verse 3. And Paul said the same in the Romans chapter 5 and verses that we began the service with. They teach us perseverance so that we become more mature Christians. It's one part of the way that we become more like Jesus. Trials and persecutions, they're the Christian equivalent of grow bags. Faith grows through learning to trust God and to persevere during hardships. Suffering proves and strengthens and deepens faith, brings us closer to Jesus as we learn to rely on Him, as we receive comfort from Him, as we more consciously aim and direct ourselves at serving Him and obeying Him. Now, that's not to say that we should go out and, and look for ways in, in which we suffer. Um, Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who was part of an assassination attempt in Hitler's life and who, who was murdered by the Nazis just before the Allies um, got there. Bonhoeffer wrote a lot about Christian discipleship and suffering, and he, he said, you know, you, you don't have to go looking for the cross if you're going to follow Jesus. Just get on with obeying him. The cross is there. You'll find it soon enough. All we've got to do is pick it up and go with it. The trials are not things then to be welcomed for their own sake. But we should consider it joy that we are worthy, being counted worthy to go the way of Christ. We should consider it a joy as saying, this is something that's going to prove my faith, prove the reality of my salvation. So count it pure joy. And then he says, verses 5 to 8, ask for wisdom. Now, it's not that long since we were doing a series on the book of Proverbs where wisdom is a very big theme in the book. And we saw that wisdom is not the same thing as knowing all the answers. Wisdom is not the same thing as having a great deal of information and great, great intellect. Wisdom was knowing how to behave appropriately, how to behave rightly in the situation. What was the next step to take? And if we are to figure out how to be faithful to the Lord in hard times, how we should behave when following Jesus is tough, we will need wisdom. And so, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Ask, pray, ask God for wisdom. Because it's not the case that every instance of suffering produces Christian growth. Sometimes we just become more bitter. Sometimes we become more disillusioned. Sometimes we blame God and, and keep Him away at a distance and say, I'm just going to chuck all of that in. It's not a direct equation. Suffering equals Christian growth. No, suffering and, and opposition means that we have to have the wisdom to ask God to say, what's going on here, so that we can consider it pure joy. Our response is not something automatic. We need to discern, need to choose, need to ask for wisdom. And notice verse 5, when we ask God for wisdom, we are asking a God who gives generously, who gives to all without finding fault, and who has promised, verse 5, to give. We also need to ask for wisdom because it's all too easy, and Christians have fallen into this trap on many an occasion, when we all too easy to mistake opposition as being opposition against the gospel, when in fact it's opposition about the way that we are telling the gospel. Sometimes Christians have been opposed or criticized, not because they're following Jesus, but they've just been judgmental or superior or obnoxious and narrow-minded and other things. We need wisdom to be able to discern. And then he says, thirdly, verses 9 to 11, take pride. 
And again, that sounds strange. I mean, it sounds strange to uh, be asked to consider it joy when you've got trials. And it's strange to, say, to hear him say, take pride, when I thought, I thought the business here was following Jesus who was humble. But elsewhere, Paul tells us that the gospel removes any basis for boasting, Romans 3.27. But what James is referring to here is a boasting and a confidence in the gospel itself and not boasting in any kind of self-promotion. He takes the example of people, whether they are rich or poor. He's saying, whether you're rich or poor, whatever end of the pecking order you find yourself, you have not to be boasting about your financial position or your economic status or your standing in society's eyes, but rather we are to see ourselves in Christ. The rich and the poor will have different experiences, different outlooks, different blind spots as well. And no matter what else James is saying, the gospel is a great leveler. We are all beggars looking to the grace of God for eternal food that only Jesus can provide. And one way that this leveling should be seen is that opposition to following Jesus will be experienced by all of us, rich and poor, clever and not so clever, fast runners and slow runners, whatever. And we are not to rely as individuals or as a congregation on our own ideas, our own energy, our own cleverness, our own financial clout or whatever. None of that's going to keep us faithful to Jesus. None of that will keep us moored to the gospel. The poor are to remember their high position. They are sons and daughters of the living God. They are exalted by the gospel. And the rich are to remember, James says, their low position. They have been humbled by the gospel. They could not buy salvation. It gave them no advantages in, in winning the love of God. The poor need to res reflect on the certainty of heaven. The rich reflect on the transience of this earth. Because it is God's estimation that matters, and it contradicts the instinctive way in which we look at things, and the things that we pick up from the world around us. So then, these three, says James in this first chapter, count it joy. Not be happy because somebody's beaten you up, but count it a joy when you have to suffer for Christ, because it will prove faith, it will give perseverance, it will bring hope. Ask for wisdom, because we need to know and understand what's going on. It's not some automatic process. And thirdly, take pride, but pride in the gospel and in God who gives that gospel and not in ourselves. And these three things are not just pieces of good advice, but they're instructions about how we see the bigger picture how we can see beyond ourselves and see that life is not just about us and see who we are in God's calling and in God's purposes. Hence, the outcome, verse 12, is not that you get wealthy, not that you will never be sick, not that you will be amazingly popular wherever you go. Rather, verse 12, the reward is the crown of life. Being received, that is, by the Lord as part of His victorious overcoming of evil. Being part of the joyful, final victory of the new heavens and the new earth. The crown of life is not something we earn, but something God graciously gives to all who persevere. To those whose first loyalty is Jesus. And one of the ways that we know that we have that first loyalty to Jesus is how we respond to trials and temptations, how we deal with challenges and oppositions to faith, how we face up to temptation, how we seek to take attention away from, from other things and follow Jesus first. And verses 13 to 15 are a reminder to us just of how bad we are. Verses 16 to 18 is how, a reminder of how good God is. And I put a quote a couple of weeks ago in, at the end of the midweek messenger exactly on that, quoting from the hymn writer John Newton, who wrote Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken and wrote Amazing Grace. Newton, towards the end of his life, said, Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great saviour. That sums up James verse, uh, verses 13 to um, 18 of chapter 1. 
We have fallen, we sin, but God is a great Savior. So then, who wants to go to heaven? Who wants to go to heaven tonight? Who wants to follow Jesus and get to know God better? Who wants to follow Jesus and get to know God better if it involves a bit of sacrifice and Oh. My favourite um, Scottish theologian um, once said, I would rather be miserable in Glasgow than happy anywhere else. I think when he made that, said that, I think it was a bit tongue-in-cheek, actually. I, mean, I think he was saying, you know, this is where I belong, this is where I've been called to, this, and I, I love this place. I don't think he was making an absolute rule of it. It certainly wouldn't go down well everywhere. I actually quoted, quoted him once in a, from a pulpit where he was often quoted, actually, um, but it didn't go down terribly well. That pulpit was in Edinburgh. Um, I would rather be miserable in G Glasgow than happy anywhere else. But actually, I think what he was saying is, you know, this is, this is, where, I, this is where I am, this is where I belong, this is, this, and this is what's most important. But what about, I would rather be suffering in Christ than having a life of ease anywhere else. You see, that wouldn't be tongue-in-cheek. That wouldn't be just something said, you know, to entertain or make some clever wee point. This is actually the essence of whether we're Christians at all. I would rather have to make sacrifices, be willing to be put upon, to endure some hostility, to be taken advantage of in order to be faithful to Jesus. I would rather that than escape all of these and miss out on the crown of life. That's the challenge of these verses in James 1. Not miserable in Glasgow or happy somewhere else, but tested, tried, taken advantage of, making sacrifices in Christ, or having an easy time but missing out on the crown of life. And just like the who wants to go to heaven and who wants to go to heaven tonight questions, that challenge asks us to reflect on what really matters to us, what we really seek first, what really counts. And love for Jesus, loyalty to Jesus, will only be seen when trials are overcome, when sufferings are endured, when sacrifices are made. So, have we made sacrifices? Been willing to suffer, been willing to take risks? wanting to share faith even though we're not very sure it's going to go down very well, give ourselves away to others, serve all for Jesus' sake, and even risk the misunderstanding and the criticisms that inevitably come. Are they worth it? Which is to say, is Jesus worth it? Let us pray. Gracious God, in our service today, we will soon celebrate communion. We will soon come to the table where we reflect on the body of Christ broken for us, the blood of Christ poured out for us. Oh, the audacity of thinking that we should come and take from Christ's broken body, from Christ's shed blood, and, and not think that it will cost us anything, demand anything of us. Oh, the audacity to think that we can follow such a Savior and 
have an easy time at the same time. Forgive us when we've thought that. Forgive us when we've sought that. Forgive us when we've lived like that. Rather, help us to count it as pure joy. Help us to ask for wisdom more readily. And help us to boast in such a saviour who died, who rose, and who is coming again for us. Amen. The communion hymn, Table of Grace. Hear the good news You've been invited No matter what Others may say Your darkest sins Will be forgiven And you will always Have a place At the table of grace Never empty, the plates always full, and it's never too late. Come and be filled with love, never ending. You're always welcome at the table of grace. So come. never empty The plate's always full And it's never too late To come and be filled With love never ending You're always welcome At the table of grace table is the Lord's table in our hours, and all who love the Lord Jesus, all who are willing to serve Him, all who are willing to share Him, all who are willing to suffer for with Him, are welcome to share with us in these gifts of, of bread and wine and whatever you, I hope, have with you. It's a, the free grace of God that calls us here to share this meal that has its roots back in the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. Let us hear how the tradition of that meal began with Jesus with his followers. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Um, the words will appear on the screen. I believe in God.
let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the wonder and the beauty of your created world, for its many gifts. And we thank you that you sustain our world day by day. We thank you for the promise of the new creation when your Son will come again and raise us up. We thank you for Jesus' first coming, for his humble, his living birth among us, for his perfect life, his obedient life, his sacrificial life. We give you thanks for his willingness to suffer for us and his triumph over death. We give thanks for His ascension to your right hand and for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise of His coming again. And so, remembering Jesus' work and pleading His eternal sacrifice, we now follow His example and command. May your Spirit be with us and on us and on the gifts of bread and wine, that indeed they might be for us the very life of Christ himself. Amen. And so we recall how our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he'd given thanks to God for it, he blessed it, and he broke it and said, this is my body, it's being broken for you. Do this remembering me. And later he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant, made in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, drink it, remembering me. These then are the gifts of God for the people of God. So take and eat the body of Christ that was broken for you. blood of Christ, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, remembering Him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for that taste of your salvation, that taste of your eternal love, that taste of your perfect love. May it fill us, thrill us, inspire us, encourage us that we might live as the body of Christ in your world today. Amen. Now, Lorna is going to lead us in our prayers for others. Let's pray. Lord our God, we come before you today in the knowledge that you are an all-powerful God. We recognise and we thank you that you hold this whole world in your hand, that nothing is outside of your grasp and outside of your power. Lord, with that in mind, we just ask that you would speak to and minister into the crisis that's unfolding in India. We've been so touched this week and um, so moved by the headlines and by um, photos and videos of funeral pyres that just seem to go on and never stop and we just pray that you would speak into that nation, that you would encourage and uplift them, that you would give them strength and um, that you would support the people who are stepping up and ministering in ways that um, the government should be and seems to be failing in. We just think too of the political unrest that seems to be just simmering below the surface in Burma and in Russia and in so many other nations 
across this world, Lord. We know that when crisis um, hits the economy and people's livelihoods are threatened, that things like this just tend to rise up from the hearts of, of people who are already living on a knife edge. And we just ask that you would um, be the peace bringer in those nations, in those households, that you would be uh, the provider, that you would be enough, that you would speak into the hearts of those nearby who do have enough, who have more than enough. And Lord, if you need to speak into our hearts, we just ask that you would soften them, that we might hear you. If there's anything we can do that we can be moved to, to support our brothers and sisters across the world in this really trying time, please, Lord, speak. We also do think of our neighbours on our doorstep who need us too. We thank you for the work of um, the food bank and all the other um, ongoing charitable organisations that have contacts within the church. We just ask that you would enable them to find new and innovative and relevant ways to work. That it would make people's lives blessed. That they would feel richer for engaging with your people and with your church. We pray too, Lord, in this time for... Um, preparations for elections and for all that that entails and all that that means. We also ask that you would just be with our leadership in our country at the moment as they try to relax our lockdowns, as they try to find a pathway back to some semblance of normal. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them the right words to speak at the right time and let your people open their hearts that they would receive wisdom and good counsel and also a joy and enthusiasm in the, the new freedoms that we hope to encounter again this summer. We just pray at this time for people who find this reopening of life and society to be an incredibly anxious time, whether it's because changes at work or changes in family life or just because being out and about in the community is a very daunting prospect. Again, Lord, in your gentleness and your wisdom and your power, speak peace. We thank you for all that you are, for all that you encourage us to be, all that you equip us and enable us to be. Thank you. Amen.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.